Hello and welcome to another interesting topic in the continuing development that we're offering of the, of the issue of confronting evil in history. Today we're turning to corporations and other large organizations which played an important role in the, uh, in the conduct and the organization and the, the implementation of many of the evils which we've surveyed to this point, including death camps, including um, the segregation of the German population and other populations across religious lines. Uh, we've seen actions by businesses and companies, which we're gonna study today. We've so far talked primarily about state actions, the actions of dictators like Hitler and Stalin, and individual actions like the ordinary men that Browning described. And we've tried to figure out in what ways their behavior, uh, how we can understand their behavior and how possibly in the future we could pre prevent their behavior. Uh, but today we're, our plan is to look at organizations which were crucial to the implementation of these plans. And large companies took barbarous actions themselves during World War II, both in Germany, in the occupied territories, and um, in uh, many places in Europe. So today we're gonna to talk about corporate complicity and corporate responsibility in the production of evil and participation in evil activity. Now, some might say that corporations, businesses, big auto companies, for example, big manufacturing companies in Germany really have very little choice in adjusting their production and their business activities to support the commands of a wartime economy. Producing more trucks, planes, bombs, petroleum, weapons, computers, presumably these are a normal and predictable part of um, doing business for domestic industries like General Motors in the US war economy and Daimler-Benz in the German war economy. So I'd like to focus a little bit on the question, what is bad conduct? What is evil conduct by a corporation in the conditions that we've been describing in the 1930s and 40s? And here is a possible answer for you to think about and kind of roll around in your minds and see what, um, how it works for you. An evil action by a corporation is complicity in the evil actions of national governments producing poison gas for gas chambers used for mass killing, producing computer systems that facilitate ethnic cleansing or genocide, facilitating the separation of workers according to whether they are Jewish or non-Jewish. All of these are above and beyond the normal business activities of a company in a wartime economy, and we could classify them as evil actions by a corporation. These are the kinds of things which I mean to describe as evil close to home in the corporation, where the corporation has embraced the policies and the actions and the values of an evil government into their own business practices. And this includes discrimination against officially hated groups, the Jews, the Roma, the gay people, either as workers or as consumers. And some companies in Germany in the 1930s, before the outbreak of war, refused to sell to Jews. Other companies, including companies we'll discuss today, dismissed uh, senior level appoint, uh, um, officers and leaders and uh, engineers and professionals because they were Jewish. This was called Aryanization. So Aryanization might take the form of firing members of these groups and led to a, 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 the implementation of an obnoxious and horrible kind of racism in, in Germany and the occupied territories. Another crime, which we're gonna talk about today, another evil action by corporations, was the use of forced labor and slave labor offered by the national government, offered by the Nazi government, but also provided by the Stalinist government under other circumstances. Using forced and slave labor is another clear way in which a corporation can commit an evil action. Another dimension of the evil of genocide is therefore the role that organizations played in carrying out mass acts of atrocity against the, against the innocent. 
And we might say that organizations, not just corporations, but uh, armies, governments, religious orders, and corporations, organizations at many levels of scope were an essential part of the evils of the 20th century. So it is important to ask the question about evil within organizations as well as about individuals. And this is important because it causes us to think about the question, how do people behave in an organization? Do they behave as independent moral agents or do they behave more like robots who are embodying and carrying out the intentions and orders of the, of the organization? There is, it turns out, in the field of business studies, a subfield which is called the study of organizational evil. And it's a very interesting collection, which I've located, um, edited by Carol Jerkowitz, called The Foundations of Organizational Evil. And here's what she has to say in her introduction about what this topic involves. Organizational evil is used here to signify the institutionalization of a set of principles whose purpose is knowingly to harm individuals with disregard for consequences beyond those that would cause immediate repercussions to the evildoer. Whereas unethical behavior is episodic and individualistic in nature, evil is systemic and embedded in the culture of the organization. Programs, policies, practices, reward systems, hiring and training, external and internal relations, all are designed with the intention to seek immediate advantage through the deliberate harm to others. And we'll see that in the instances of the companies that you've been reading about, this is a pretty um, insightful analysis. So what are those companies? IG Farben uh, is one company that was especially important um, during the Nazi period, prior to the Nazi period, before the World War II and during World War II. It was the largest company and the largest chemical company um, in Germany for quite a long time. So the, the book from which you've read uh, some excerpts by Hayes, um, uh, what he finds is that there is substantial corporate complicity at Farben, complicity with the evil intent of the Nazi regime. Here's his background description of Farben's um, reach. By 1943, the concerns 334 plants and mines across Germany and occupied Europe were turning out more than 3 billion marks worth of goods and earning net profits of more than a half billion. Nearly 50%, get that figure, 50% of IG's 330,000 person workforce had come to consist of conscript or slave laborers by 1943, among whom were some of the perhaps 30,000 inmates of Auschwitz who eventually died in the company's new factory and mines near the Auschwitz camp. This is stunning fact about Farben. One of the subsidiaries of Farben was the industrial source for Zyklon B, the extermination gas used to kill more than a million concentration camp victims, primarily at Auschwitz. And so you might say Farben was a Nazi company. It was a company that was inspired by an ideological commitment to Nazi doctrine and Nazi racism, Nazi expansionism. But Hayes, in a way, has an even more alarming analysis of the behavior of Farben. He argues that ideology, including Nazi ideology, had little to do with Farben's corporate decision-making. Rather, the company was driven by the business logic of profit and loss. Rather than ideology, he emphasizes business rationality as the motivating factor for business executives during the period. And he cautions that these same motivations may recur in many other contexts. And in our discussion, we may wanna talk about other companies like, well, other companies uh, to see whether we're aware of um, wrong, inappropriate, immoral, and perhaps even uh, evil practices of other companies um, in the conduct of their business. Quoting from Hayes, the amoral pragmatism and professionalism that propelled Farben's executives dwell within all large-scale organizations, whether they be corporate or political, 
whether they seek to maximize power or profits, whether they claim to serve an individual, a class, or a race. These drives made Farben an instructive case study in the plasticity of private interests and the consequences of permitting any single-minded doctrine to grasp the levers of a state. Lest that point be lost and readers distance themselves too far and easily from Farben's behavior, I have em emphasized here the specious rationality of the concerns, deeds, and largely let the self-evident wickedness of some of them speak for itself. And I'd like to discuss this passage uh, when we get together. So it would appear that the morality of efficiency of business rationality involves a truncated worldview that looks something like this, a truncated way of looking at the world, looking at action in the world. We make X, we make something, synthetic oil, punch card machines, automobiles. Our organizational goal is simply to design and manufacture these goods as efficiently as possible without concerning ourselves about the uses that others will put them to, and perhaps without regard to the origins of the resources, including labor, that the regime puts at our disposal to facilitate the process. So a purely, uh, he uses the word pragmatic, we might say a pure means end rationality based on profit and loss. This Morality of efficiency, then, is a deliberate form of tunnel vision or myopia. And I use those terms to suggest that th this is a way of looking at the world that deliberately disregards other relevant facts. So a, a deliberate myopia in which the product and process are the sole object of attention, whereas the uses, intentions, and processes of the state are not. So why did forced labor come into the equation? Well, the fundamental point is that Germany was vastly overextended in its military ambitions. The army was extremely large and that was based on Hitler's calculation that uh, war in Europe could be short. So uh, the, the war could be conducted with a short time mobilization of the mass of men between 18 and 30 and that they could then be returned to manufacturing and agriculture after the war was over. That turned out not to be the case. Hitler was involved in an extended war over multiple years. And so labor shortages were a critical problem throughout wartime Germany and at um, the Opel plant in particular, which we've studied. One possible solution by corporate directors and planners was seen in enemy prisoners of war. The first Opel Rüsselsheim prison camp was built in July 1940 and was soon occupied by 600 French and Belgian prisoners. This comes from the book by uh, Bilstein. In February of 1942, the SS Central Agency approved the Osterbeiterlasse, Osterbeiterlasse, permitting the conscription of the conscription of Soviet civilians and later other civilians from Eastern European conquest zones. And the Opel Rüsselsheim plant was the first location to receive a consignment of forced workers from the East. So the German government and then German companies, many companies, um, tried to uh, ease the labor shortage by making use of conscripted workers from conquered territories. But it is very interesting that Opel was the only large German vehicle producer not to employ concentration camp prisoners in the period that followed at either of its two production plants. So Opel declined to use concentration camp um, prisoners. It did use forced laborers, but it did not use concentration camp uh, prisoners. The company's tradition was conservative, but not at all anti-Semitic. Opel's forced laborers, both prisoners of war and civilians, were guarded by company Werkschutz. Concentration camp prisoners were to be guarded by SS henchmen. What about Ford Motor Company and more specifically Ford's uh, subsidiary, Ford Verka, in Germany? Well, it turns out, and there, there were allegations that Ford Motor Company, the international corporation, was morally responsible for the use of Ford labor, of, for, of forced labor in Germany at Ford Verka plant um, 
knowingly and um, consistently throughout World War II. But in 2001, Ford Motor Company completed a very extensive review of its corporate archives, as well as those of Ford Verka, the German subsidiary, and German and US government sources. And here is an important um, uh, text from the summary report based on this review. The use of foreign and forced labor at Ford Verka began in 1940 40, and generally followed the same pattern as at other industrial facilities in Germany. Foreigners from Eastern and Western Europe as well as Italian and French POWs were put to work at Ford Verka. These men and women lived in barracks constructed by Ford Verka adjacent to its plant site in what became known in Cologne as the Ford Camp. After the Reichsbahn or the German railways, Ford Verka was the largest, the next largest employer of forest workers in Cologne. Later in the war, men from the concentration camp Buchenwald also worked at Ford Verka as slave laborers. So this is very, very serious. This is a, a, a subsidiary of Ford Motor Company located in Germany with operations in occupied territories. And it is now known with historical accuracy, the extent and the fact of its uh, use of prisoners of war, forced laborers, and eventually concentration camp prisoners. However, the key finding of this review of Ford archives is the conclusion, which is endorsed by a very well-respected historian of business, Simon Reich. It was uh, assessed that Ford headquarters in Dearborn had essentially no knowledge or control of Ford Verka management decisions after the declaration of war in 1941, including the use of forced labor. This is a, an important finding. Ford headquarters in Dearborn had essentially no knowledge and no control of Ford Verka management decisions after the declaration of war in 1941. The report takes the view then that Ford Verka was functionally autonomous. The German subsidiary was functionally autonomous from its nominal owners in the US during the wartime years and that its management in Cologne was eager to cultivate business and military relationships with the Nazi regime in order to maintain the business viability of the operation. In other words, the evil crimes of Ford Verka were well documented, but this assessment, and it's a, an assessment which I found um, very credible, holds that um, the multinational corporation, the corporate headquarters in Dearborn, um, lacked both information, both knowledge, and also an ability to control the actions of Ford Verka. Forced and, for, uh, forced and foreign laborers were in fact a sizable percentage of the total workforce at Ford Verka. The archive report indicates that, quote, the highest number of foreign and forced workers at any time during the war was about 2000, which occurred in 1944. And this is about 40% of the workforce. Quote, statements from denazification files report that Russians, children as well as adults, received poor food rations. In an interview conducted in the 1990s, one former Eastern worker recalled that her rations typically consisted of three slices of bread and unsweetened coffee for breakfast, soup made from turnips and flour siftings for lunch, and bread and coffee again for dinner. This is not a subsistence diet. Is there US corporate responsibility for these um, uh, crimes against humanity conducted by Ford Verka. It seems from the evidence of the review of all of these different sorts of archives that the corporate directors of the companies in Germany, Ford Verka in particular, bear significant moral and legal responsibility for these actions. However, careful review of the company archives by independent researchers strongly supports the idea that the US-based corporate leaders did not have knowledge and did not have control over events in their German subsidiaries after 1940. These facts about the behavior of Farben and uh, German auto and heavy manufacturing companies, including Ford Verka, 
These facts suggest that it is hugely important to assess culpability for illegal and immoral actions taken by these companies when those actions are uncovered after war, after ethnic cleansing, after genocide. If Opel or Ford Verka provided only starvation rations for its forced workers, if these companies used lethal force as a way of controlling their forced labor contingents, again documented, if the companies provided unconscionably low levels of medical care for their unwilling workers, if these companies actively sought out the use of concentration camp prisoners as slave labor, then the, the officers and executives who were responsible for these actions should be held responsible. That seems like a pretty clear um, conclusion of ethics, morality, and justice. And in fact, there was some post-war accountability for corporate actions. There were three war crimes trials, not the Nuremberg trials, but another set of war crimes trials, which took place after the end of World War II, involving German industrialists who were responsible for making use of forced labor by conquered civilians and the use of slave labor from concentration camps, as well as the crimes of plundering and despoliation, membership in the Nazi party, and other crimes. These were among the subsequent Nuremberg trials conducted by US military authorities, and they involved trials of executives from IG Farben, Krupp, and another company, Friedrich Flick. Here is an important finding from one of the um, judges who was involved in these trials who wrote a dissent about the uh, uh, somewhat lenient findings which were found in the Farben case. He was one of the judges in the Farben trial concerning the charge of the use of slave labor and the defense of necessity by Farben executives. Executives said basically they had no choice, they simply had to use slave labor. And here is um, Judge Hebert's um, statement. Willing cooperation with the slave labor utilization of the Third Reich was, quote, a matter of corporate policy that permeated the whole Farben organization. For this reason, criminal responsibility goes beyond the actual immediate participants at Auschwitz. It also includes other farben borstand plant managers, and embraces all who knowingly participated in the shaping of corporate policy. And what is that policy? It's the policy of cooperating with um, the use of slave labor in manufacturing and in other industry. There was another kind of um, accountability which occurred much, much later in the very end of the 1990s, 90, 98 and 99. And this took the form of class action lawsuits, which were initiated by uh, Eastern worker survivors who had been forced to work at Ford Verka and other plants. Um, their um, class action lawsuit brought in US courts was against companies for having um, treated them unjustly and not having compensated them basically for their labor. Much of the evidence which we now have about corporate behavior during the Nazi period by auto companies and other major industries resulted from these class action lawsuits, including especially a suit led by Ukrainian woman Elsa Iwanova in 98 and 99. And these lawsuits led to a sudden willingness on the part of General Motors and Ford Motor Company to make their corporate archives from the Nazi period available for study by researchers. This open um, exposure of the corporate archives is hugely important and it plays into another theme in this course. That is the theme of honesty. It is so important to honestly confront the evil and dark facts about the past, even when they are profoundly embarrassing. Ford Motor Company and uh, General Motors had not made their archives available until they were essentially forced to by these class action lawsuits. So what can we demand of corporations? What can we demand of corporations, large organizations? We know the slogan from Google, don't do evil. That is a real moral imperative. Whether or not Google or Facebook or any other internet company lives up to it, whether Coca-Cola company lives up to it, and in fact, I think we have good reason to think that these companies do not live up to that 
that uh, slogan. But we, what we need to demand of corporations is that the officers, executives, directors, and other actors within corporations have to reach their own moral conclusions about the actions of the company, about, in the case of uh, the Nazi period, Aryanization, firing Jewish workers, the use of slave labor, the production of materials used in gas chambers, Cyclone B, and engagement in genocide. Officers, what we are basically asserting, officers and executives of companies need to make their own moral assessment, and then they need to refuse to collaborate. And I think we've seen often enough in this course, in the readings of this course, that refusal was an option. Refusal and evasion of evil commands um, was in many, many instances um, possible and, and uh, did not lead to what it did lead to in the case of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, execution. But for, for most individuals who um, in any way resisted Nazi commands, the consequences were not deadly. So we might say the, the moral prescription for corporations in a time of evil is don't do evil, don't collaborate with evil. Thanks. <laughs>